Moving on to the next session. The next session we have Dr. Gopi Krishna sir as the speaker and his topic is journey of an endodontist. To introduce sir, I would like to call upon Dr. Aida Mapp. Dr. Aida is the Dean, Professor Emeritus and the head of the Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics in Goa Dental College and Hospital. She completed her BDS and MDS from Gujarat University. Ma'am is a member of reviewing board of Journal of Conservative Dentistry, Journal of Indian Dental Association. Ma'am has publications in 38 indexed and 40 non-indexed journals. We welcome you, Ma'am. Dial is all yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Vidya. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Gopi Krishna. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. Okay, Go thank you. Um, Dr. V. Gopi Krishna is a BDS, MDS, PhD, and is currently working as an adjunct professor at Sri Ramachandra Institute of Higher Education and Research, Chennai. He has the honor of being the secretary for International, International Federation of Endodontic Associations, that is IFEA, as well as general secretary for the Indian Board of Endodontics. Dr. Gopi is the editor-in-chief for the Endodontology Journal and the associate editor of European Endodontic Journal. He is also the founder director of Root Canal Foundation based at Chennai, India, besides being the editor of three reputed textbooks, which are running in the eighth edition now. Dr. Gopi Krishna has presented 300 plus invited podium lectures globally. With this impressive mini introduction, I present to you Dr. Gopi Krishna, who will guide you through the journey of an endodontist. Over to you, Dr. Gopi. Pleasure being introduced by you, Dr. Aida. Thank you very much for these kind words of introduction. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Mahalakshmi, uh, ma'am, and her team for bringing up this very innovative uh, concept, I think much needed concept of what the undergraduate needs to plan uh, for their future when they are at their crossroads. So my kudos personally to the team. There's an intriguing topic and I've tried to make it uh, by reflecting. I think you can only give advice from your life journey. And I have tried my best to give certain pointers which helped me in my life journey in the last three decades. Uh, once I have finished my BDS. So I hope this uh, next 40 minutes of lecture would be uh, insightful and useful uh, for the participants. Thank you once again for this kind words of introduction and I'd like to now go ahead with the lecture. to be part of this very interesting a very good morning to one and all and it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to be part of this very interesting symposium being organized by SRM Dental College and IACD titled Pulp 22 uh, which basically is talking about the prospects of undergraduates and the roadmap ahead and I have been asked to present on a topic which I've never been asked before. It's try to give a roadmap for uh, students about the clinical aspects of what is the potential for uh, the journey of being an endodontist. So this presentation actually made me reflect on my own journey, uh, trying to understand that what were the things which made me do what I did and which are the aspects which probably if I was given, I would correct myself and also share it with my friends and students for them uh, to probably pick up few few important points that, that could be of use to them in their journey ahead. So that's the whole plan for this next 40 minute presentation. How to be, uh, uh, to look forward for what aspects of being an endodontist. Uh, in my brief introduction, I told you that I've been a person who's played, who's had many hats. I've been an, a teacher, a full-time academician. I've been an author, I've been, uh, writing textbooks involved with Crossman Studio Event, preclinical manual, which many of your students might have gone through, hopefully. 
And uh, I've also been associated with two of the, uh, the main journals in India, the Journal of Conservative Dentistry and the Endodontology. And currently, I'm now involved with the European Endodontic Journal. So I have had my stint in academics. I had my stint as a teacher, as in research in terms of both publishing as well as in uh, editing textbooks. I'm also actively involved in various endodontic associations, which are both nationally and internationally, including the Indian Endodontic Society, as well as the International Federation of Endodontic Associations. So this gives me a more or less a bird's eye view of what's happening in the world of endodontics. And, and above all this, what is very endearing and close to me has been my journey of training students through my foundation called the Root Canal Foundation. Over the last 10 years, our foundation has trained more than 1,750 students and clinicians around the country and the world. And uh, this is a project which is very close and personal to me. Apart from uh, the clinical aspect of doing endodontics day to day, uh, right now I'm a full-time clinician most of the times and I focus my energies on trying to improve and bring out clinical protocols that would be of substance to be and that can be uh, that can be used by one and all. So that is me uh, in a brief. Uh, and uh, what can I offer to you today, in the next 35 minutes? What do we do in dentistry after BDS? That's the question being asked here. What next? And the question is a question which every one of us faces uh, as a crossroad. I have faced this, everybody does it. And most of us, when we don't have a pop, uh, particularly good answer, what to do after BDS, we normally end up doing MBS. And that's what I became a specialist, not because I wanted to be a specialist. I really did not know what to do after doing BDS. And the best bet was to specialize in something. And that's how I ended up. So my journey has not been something which has been pre-planned. I have been a person who has taken the path as it came. I wanted to be a medico. I didn't get enough marks, so I joined dentistry. I wanted to be an oral surgeon. I could not get that and I joined uh, being an endodontist. So sometimes uh, life is not a perfect uh, straight road. You, you take uh, paths and as it comes across, you take the best decisions which you go ahead. So the question when somebody asks me, is uh, dentistry a good cup of tea? Is it a lovely profession? Uh, should I join the endodontics or which speciality should I take? The answer to that is I give this analogy of chess. Those who have ever played chess, uh, can anybody tell me which is the best move in the game of chess? Is there something called the best move in the game of chess? Actually, there is no such move. In every game, a different move is considered as the best move according to that game. And each one of us here is playing a different game of life. Your life, my life, everything is independent and individual. So what might work for me might not work for you. So the question is, what do we do? How do we address this question of what do we do after BDS and what is what, what to look forward in endodontics or dentistry? For that, I'm going to share with you a few things which I believe in. One of the first things which I used to think was that scoring marks is so important. It is academically being sound. The knowledge is very important. It makes your clinical work better. But there's a difference between scoring marks versus scoring in life. Now, all the students who are listening to this, you are all equals. You are all in a class of, say, 80 to 100 students, and all of you are just alphabetically spread out, and that's it. You're all equals. Some of you, all of you will pass dentistry, and you will move out. So you start equally. But you don't end up equally. If you look at this guy, Usain Bolt is probably the greatest sprinter ever on earth. And so there are a lot of sprinters, but what makes certain people reach heights? What is it that they have that make them so special? So my, my understanding in this presentation is trying to tell you what are the key ingredients which would probably make you fulfill your own potential. Not the potential what others see in you, but your own inner potential. For that, my analogy is I always considered life as a milkshake. If you look at any profession, any profession, sports, music, uh, business, dentistry, 100 specialists or 100 dentists, all of them are not equal. If you look at a profession of 100 people, 20 of them would be failures, 20%. In any profession, yeah. you look around, they won't do well, they're struggling. It's not probably made for them because they do not have the innate thirst and the, and the passion to do that profession. So 20% is an internationally accepted common burnout rate of any profession. And then there is a 70% mass on top of it. These are the people who daily go to their jobs. 
they are dentists who daily go to work, they are teachers, they are, they are every sphere, they are, these are the bulk of the population of the world which go and do work daily. But they don't excel in it. They survive, they have a house, they have things, but they don't excel in it. If you look at any profession, you have only 10%, which is called the cream. In some professions, it's less than 5%. In some professions, it's less than 1%. So if you are in sports, it's 0.1, 0.2% of sports people are very successful. Remaining are not. In dentistry, my understanding is 10%. 10% of our professionals are very successful. Now, the question you have to ask is, do you have it in you to be in this top 10%? So what differentiates this top 10% from the remaining 90%? And for that, the answer is, people say that it's because of the age we are born in, where we are born, to whom we are born, circumstances, but these are things you can't control. We are all Indians, we are here, that's it. We, we don't control the ovarian lottery of to whom you are born. You don't control the circumstance that we are in the age of corona pandemic where last two years we did hardly anything as a clinician or as a student. It's a challenging circumstance. You can't control this. But what is important is what you can control. The two things I have realized that you can control is your choices and your influences. Your choices of your friends, your choices of your mentors, your choices of what you're going to do day to day determines your ultimate position and your progress in life. So these are the two things which I keep telling my students that you need to be about. What are your choices? Do something which you're really interested in. Is it aesthetic dentistry? It's endodontics? It's ortho? It could be anything. I recently met a person who's so passionately interested in forensic odontology. And this person would do great in it because this person is interested in it. So the key is to choose a line in dentistry which you're really liking or you're passionate about. Don't go for it that which makes more money because money is a byproduct. It will come. If you're good, it will come. So choose an area or sphere of interest which you really like. I did not choose my field of endodontics also by choice, but in this field of aesthetic dentistry and conservative dentistry and endodontics, I love endodontics. So that's why I chose that to be my choice. So the other area is to make sure that you choose your influences carefully, choose your mentors wisely. The moment you finish PDS, you would join some practice. You would be under the influence of some mentors who are senior to you. You will watch them closely without your knowledge. You will mimic them in every aspect of your life. So make sure you choose the right mentors. In my life, I was, I had, as a, as a consultant, I went to many places, but there were two people who always impressed me with their style and their, and their ethical way of working, Dr. Acharya and Dr. Naidu. So to me, they were my early clinical mentors. So I used to pick up a lot of things about my life of how I should probably lead my clinical work or many aspects of my academic work were inspired by these two people. So choose your mentors. So look around. So the first clinic you go to take a job, make sure that they are practicing the right things. Because you go to a wrong place, you will pick up all those things and come out. So this is my most important tip I give to any dentist who, who graduates. I say, locate in your city the best practitioner or the person who is, the, who, who is wise and does the right things the right way. Go join them. Even if they don't pay you anything, go join them because that's what they will, you will learn from them, priceless things which college degrees won't buy. So what did I learn during my post-graduation? So the question comes as, okay, what did you pick up in your MDS? What to look forward for an MDS? Before I tell you that what you will do in endo, which is simple, I can show you a couple of cases to, to make you understand what endodontics is all about. I will teach you what I learned in post-graduation that I never knew that I will learn. The first thing which I learned the hard way was this, that failure is good. Uh, nowadays, failure is considered uh, very bad. You don't fail in anything in your college days. You, everything gets approved and uh, every exam is just, uh, just uh, another day in the college. You just go attend and you pass. But when I was doing my endo, uh, there was this, uh, I used to be also in my college days, uh, uh, I used to love the favorite sport for me was not cricket, it used to be basketball. And to me, the boat of all time has always been Michael Jordan and the way he has excelled himself. And I really loved his philosophy on failure because he always used to say that only if you fail, you would, it, would, it would push you to do things better. In my life, I got the Michael Jordan moment in the form of an inlay. 
uh, the, the funny story is uh, I almost wanted to quit my post-graduation. And that's the truth. Uh, four or five months into my post-graduation, I was a little depressed because I was not getting it right. My inlays were getting rejected one after the other. And in the preclinical lab, my inlay got rejected 15 times. So my 16th attempt of an inlay preparation casting got uh, approved. It took me about two months to do this whole process of 15 repeats. Trust me when I say it is very depressing and I felt that I don't have the trait to uh, be a an dentist or a conservative operative dentist and I wanted to quit. And my 16th inlay got approved by my teacher who in his wisdom made me repeat it again and again till I got it right. I was not happy with that, obviously, but if you look back to that moment, my 16th inlay becoming approved, I, I was so happy because 16th is my birthday and I started believing in numerology because probably I felt 16 is my lucky number and that's why my 16th inlay got approved. But the joke is 10 years later from this incidence of my inlays getting rejected, I was, I was working with uh, the American editors of Studivent and I was bringing out the Asian edition of uh, Studivent and I was editing the chapter on inlay and I felt life as a huge circle. Uh, the inlay which made me have sleepless nights, uh, the same chapter I'm sitting and editing after 10 years. So what I learned from this uh, part of my life was that sometimes failure is necessary. It is a key ingredient. It is not palatable. It is painful, but it really pushes us in the right direction. Uh, similarly, the other aspect which I keep sharing is whether we are perseverant or talented. I get a lot of students who, who, who call others lucky. They are some who are talented. I especially had seen in my preclinical days, in my UG days, that there are some students who can cow very well, some students who are preclinical work is very nice, and they are born talented. And I would feel I'm not one of them. I've never been a born talented person, but I have always felt that if you do not have talent, then there should be something else which you should have, which is called perseverance. And uh, I, I learned this from sports. If you look at the, my personal favorite in tennis, has always been Roger Federer. But the debate of who's the vote between Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic finally came to be answered recently this year when Nadal played one of the best matches of his career to win his 21st Grand Slam. And if you ask me personally, of the three of them, who's the most talented? I don't think Nadal is the most talented. But if you ask me who's the most perseverant, Nadal is the most perseverant. And that's why probably in the Hall of Fame of tennis, he will be the greatest ever. Although he's not my personal favorite, he's now become one, but I personally look at his journey as a perfect example where perseverance can always beat talent. So remember this. So in my, my journey, what I've read is this. When you are doing things initially the right times, the first 80% of your effort would hardly give any, any result. You keep doing the things right. You're trying to improve yourself, but the results will not be seen. It's like going to the gym to build up your body or any aspect of your life. The result is not seen immediately. But the discipline to keep doing the right things over a period of time is what gives you the final results. So in my, my uh, uh, book of life, uh, this is a wall in my clinic, in my training center, the, what you see at the wall behind me. And uh, this is one of the quotations of, uh, which I have made and which I have put on my wall, uh, which reminds me what I should do every day. I firmly believe perseverance beats talent if talent is not perseverant. Talent is important, but that is not everything. There are many talented people who could not do well in life, but all perseverant people ultimately do well in life. So if there's one ingredient you need to bring into you, it's perseverance. The next aspect is the concept of luck. We always have somebody in our class whom we consider as lucky. And to me, the best definition of luck is this. Luck is equal to opportunity meeting preparation. Opportunity plus being prepared gives you luck. So there are two ingredients. One, I can't control. Opportunities I cannot control. When the opportunity comes, nobody knows. But being prepared, I can control. So when you want to be lucky, I always tell, be prepared. And to me, in my life, if you ask me, some of my friends have asked me, you're very lucky to have edited Grossman at a very young age. But my luck started during my postgraduate days. 
My teacher made all of us write articles, but the only student in my batch who was serious about and writing articles was me. And this is the one of the favorite love letters I ever received. Uh, it's an international journal of endodontics. And I, those days, there was no emails. And we used to write letters up and down. And this is an acceptance letter of my first international publication, roughly dated 20 years back in the year 2002. And when this came to me, I was probably one of the first students in India to ever get a publication in JOE when I was a PG student. And this is what propelled me towards getting an opportunity to work in Crossbow. One of my teachers, Dr. Suresh Chandra, chose me as his co-editor, mainly because of this, because of my ability to have published so early. So the luck which people think was created, it was not something which you get by random chance. So in my opinion, the other quote, which I strongly believe in in my life is this. This is again a quote which I've pasted on the wall of my training center that says, craft your destiny and create your luck. Because luck is something which is manufactured and is not bought over the shelf. The other thing which I would recommend all students listening is to attend conferences, meet people who are senior. Wisdom is the only thing which you can't buy. It comes with experience and experience comes with time. So I keep, in my personal opinion, I keep meeting people. I keep looking at people who are wise. I'm not talking meet old people. It doesn't mean age should not be confused with wisdom. I keep talking of people who can give you certain inputs which propels you. In my personal endodontic career, there were a couple of speakers randomly whom I met and listened to who inspired me to do better things. Ben Johnson's lecture was the lecture which really inspired me to do the rotary endodontics 20 years back. And Ingle's lecture really inspired me to, to, to be a better self of myself, to do something to the world of endodontics. It's just a spark which, which you can't ignite on your own. It needs a catalyst which is always external. So go listen to people, meet conferences, and meet people, and you see what best you could uh, gain from them. So the question, does endodontics have a future? As a, as a viable profession. Should you join PG and Endo? Should you do, become an endodontist? My simple answer is, if you like doing endodontics, if you have empathy towards pain, then Endo has got a fantastic future. But any profession has got a good future if you have two things. The first thing is demand. So we always say that if you want to sell shoes, please go meet, go sell shoes in a city or to a person who loves shoes. So looking at here, the picture, a person loves buying many pairs of shoes. He's a good customer. The other is go, go sell shoes in a village or city where there are no one wearing shoes. Again, that means you have a fantastic potential. So now you want to do endodontics. You should have patients who need endodontics. So the question is, does India need endodontics? This is a study done by us about seven years back, and we were trying to find out how many people in India actually need endo. And you know what the results are? By the year 2040, 35 to 40, which is 10, 15 years from now, the total Indian population, all adults inclusive, would roughly have two palpably involved teeth per person, 1.4 to 1.8 teeth per person. That means in their lifetime, most people will have to go to a dentist for at least two palpal procedures, which if you calculate in a 1.3 billion population with 30 billion teeth, the number of diseased teeth would be, would be tremendous. So what is so important is that the need for endodontic and vital pulp procedures in India would be tremendous as time comes and we need good professionals for that. So the question is, does India have a potential for endodontists? I think we all have a fantastic potential for endodontics in this country. And that's what I do. This is what I've been doing. And one of the defining moments of an endodontic procedure is your ability to do it under the microscope. So what would, what would differentiate a general dentist from an endodontist is the microscope. So using a microscope is what will define us, what will make us see things which others cannot. So what you see on the left is a, a access opening by a general practitioner. What you see on the right is what you could do under the microscope. So the microscope opens up our eyes, not just to see things bigger. It enables us to do things in a much, much more refined way. And that's what the world wants from us. They want quantity and not quality. So if you want to trace extra canals, you need a microscope. If you want to do procedures in which for this, you want to, uh, to do every step of endodontics in a much better way, 
then you need uh, what you call a microscope. So what you see here is a, a microscope at which we are working and we are able to see the whole procedure on here. point is that you can see things and your ability to diagnose and do things is absolutely transformed. And to me, and magnification is not the future, it is the current present and magnification along with diagnostic aids like a cone beam CT will change the way we practice endo. So you will be able to do procedures, not only doing root canal therapy, but also your ability to save teeth from, from uh, pulpectomies, doing partial pulpotomies, doing procedures to protect the pulp and save the pulp is much more, and that is the crux of our field. So it's an amazing field which requires 75 to 80% of all procedures of, of general dentistry comes under our field. So that's what is a brief uh, overview of what you can do in our field. The other lessons which I heard, uh, which I learned the hard way is to treat the patient and not just through a tear, treat the tooth. When you are a student, you will simply treat the tooth. But one of the lessons I picked up was this, is that I met a patient who had this end of procedure done in their mouth, which is not a great procedure. Uh, if you look at silver points and, and the other root is not obturated, whereas I, I, I did this endo in the same patient's mouth. Obviously, I did the procedure on the right. The x-ray looks very nice and all, all done up to the working length and all obturated well with all the tenets of endodontics. But this patient was not comfortable with my treatment because the patient, the patient felt the treatment was painful. So one of the important lessons I learned in endo in our field is not only you need to do the procedure uh, in the right way, but you should also do it in a painless way. And the moment you are able to combine this painless aspect of doing treatment with perfectly doing the treatment, that's when you start becoming a successful endodontic clinician. And that's what I strive to be. I not only want to do things right, but I also want to do it in a very, very pain-free way is the key to be a successful clinician. So there's this common saying, learn the tricks of the trade. Learn the tricks of the trade, because there are a lot of tricks and tips. People ask me for tips, uh, how to do endo better. But I'll always tell my students, learn the trade. Simply learn the trade. Get the skills right. Always that's the key. Get the skill right and then practice it 100 times. Don't practice blindly because if you're doing a wrong thing 100 times, you become an expert in doing things wrong. You don't become right. So what is most important is your ability to learn the right things first. So when people ask me, what are the ingredients needed to be a good endodontist? Endo means tracing canals, disinfecting the canals, and optimal epithel and uh, coronal seal. But to me, that's not the key to be an endodontist. I'll always tell my students, learn the right skills first. After you have learned the right skills, have the passion to repeat it and perseverantly do it repeatedly so that you become an expert in it. And once you become an expert in it, you then practice it on your patients in an ethical and compassionate way. The moment you do these three aspects, success is yours. That is what is the real ingredient of a successful clinician. So ask yourself this question, whenever, in your life, you're going to start your practice. Some of you can start your practice at the BDS. If you can invest your time on good learning skills and practicing and doing it, I know some of the best clinical practitioners in, in Chennai and India are BDS practitioners. So MBS is not a gateway for excellence. It is just one of the pathways to excellence. So whenever and wherever you start your practice, ask this question, why should a patient choose your practice over other dental practices? Why should they choose it? Because there should be a unique differentiating point of your dental practice. You just cannot be one in a thousand clinics in the practice. That doesn't mean you build a, build a big practice or not. There should be something which you do which is different and better than others. There should be a skill set which you have, which others don't have. 
So invest on that skill set before you start your practice. It could be anything. It could be anything. It could be pediatric dentists. It could be endodontics. It could be aesthetic dentists. It could be uh, aligners. It could be any aspect. It could be even uh, oral medicine radiology in the way uh, CBCT machines are being diagnosed. So there are so many avenues in clinical dentistry, but you need to invest time to learn the skill set and be an expert in it before you start your practice. And then you market your practice with that. The name of my center is Wood Canal Foundation. For the last 20 years, I have invested my time and energy in building a practice which is based on this. And hence, I attract patients around the country and some from abroad for root canal therapy. So that is my UDP, my unique differentiating point. We do everything in my center. We do all practice, all, all specialties. But what is the attracting point is root canal therapy. So that's what you need to do. And remember the law of C. This is a very nice law which I read in a book. And what the law of C says is, no matter which seed it is, whether it's a walnut, whether it's an apple or a lemon or whatever you plant it, you can't expect the fruit the next day. You can't expect it in six months. You can't expect it in a year. Depending on, on the seed, it would take a particular number of years or seasons for it to give you the fruit. But when it gives you the fruit, it gives you an abundance. In dentistry, according to me, it takes four years at least to establish your identity, a minimum of four years, depending on how good you are. So don't expect magic to happen the next day when you come out of dentistry and think that everything will be all right. No profession is like this, including dentistry. So it takes a number of years to establish your name and identity for people to trust you. The word trust is a very, very small word, but it's one of the biggest ingredients for people for us to grow. Only when people trust you, they come to you. So remember the law of seed, and the law of seed to be successful, you need to be ethical and graceful. Do your things the right way, repeatedly, follow the right things, invest on the right materials in your practice, and then wait for things to fall into place. Do not follow shortcuts. I have never seen a clinician who follows shortcuts prosper for long in any field. It doesn't work. You can cheat people with your words, but your actions will always show through. And clinical practice is based on your actions. The last part which I would like uh, to share is, apart from all this, apart from all the serious things, you need to have a group of people who are your sounding board. What I call sounding board, people who will tell you a frank feedback. It's like a mirror in the wall. If you're out of shape, it shows you're out of shape. Simple as that. A mirror is your frank feedback. And have well-wishers who don't wish you to be in a well. They tell you the right advice. Sometimes they may not be the right things you want to hear, but they tell you what it is. That's why we don't like our parents and teachers, because they keep reflecting things back to you. So I try to find a couple of friends who will give you a frank feedback. I feel it's very important in life. I have a couple of friends who have the liberty to come and tell me, good thing, this is not right, or this is something which you should do better. So I feel that is so important for you to progress in life. Otherwise, you just don't know where you're heading. So I don't have a big group of friends, but I do definitely have three or four people who probably don't want me to die. And the best friends you'll ever make in life are in college, and they will be your friends for your lifetime. So my previous batchmate, our batch was known as the Titans, and my previous batchmate, Titan batchmate, are my best friends. I enjoy spending time with them even now. So try to make good relationships in your college days right now, and uh, this will continue for the rest of your life. And the other aspect which I feel strongly is have a hobby. A hobby is something which would make you feel good when the, when the days are bad. So it could be anything, it could be a sport, it could be something, but it's just an active habit which you do. And to me, it has always been nature and photography. So I enjoy spending time and hikes, trekking and going to different places and watching things in nature. It gives me my inner peace. So I recommend each one of you, follow a hobby. Don't leave it. All of us during school and college days used to have liked something. Continue that throughout your professional life. Those who do that will be much more balanced and much more mentally, spiritually, and in every aspect, successful. The last slide is that I love movies and especially cartoon movies. And uh, in every of these movies, I, I see some message. And you know what? One of my all-time favorites has been Kung Fu Panda. And what Kung Fu Panda, all the three parts I really enjoy. And the Kung Fu Panda movie taught me this very important message in life. 
this message is this the most important variable in life is you you are the most important variable not your circumstances not the college where you're studying so now sometimes whether should I have studied in this college or that college or should I have been born in this place or that place should I have been practicing in this city or that city should I be in India or should I migrate out it's all in India. there are no such thing called right choices in this every road is fine but it depends on the traveler who travels the road so to me the most important variable which you should plan is you look at yourself make sure that you have the right ingredients to go ahead and take the road of life because the life is a very beautiful journey if you know how to travel in it so the road of life has no google maps to tell you this symposium is not going to give you a picture perfect google map but it definitely gives you ingredients i really love the various concepts which are being discussed in this symposium and i hope that each lecture triggers something in you and some of you can take these beginning seeds and these seeds sprout into something which tangibly takes you ahead in your life. Uh, with that, I'd like to show you a, a bit about our uh, the, my my foundation, which I really, uh, which is uh, one of my areas where I really enjoy spending my time. The Canal Foundation and one of my dreams has to be, and I believe in these three three words: that you have to embark, you have to evolve, and you have to excel in life. These are the three aspects on, based on which my foundation is based, and I. I, someday you are you are invited to just drop in and see both the clinical practice and what we do at our foundation and uh, we also do a lot of training programs and i'm going to show you something but uh, what we do what is we do Uh, with that, I'll take this opportunity to also tell you one of the aspects of our foundation has been to uh, motivate students. And for the last 10 years, this is the 10th year in which I we institute a Young Achievers Scholarship uh, Program. This is a total program, 100% scholarship, there's no institution fees or anything. Uh, you attend a three day complimentary and to the gym on our foundation. The dates for this year in 2022 is July 22, 2024, and it's eligible for one turn per college around India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. Who will who have scored the highest marks in the final examination? Uh, so, so all the toppers uh, can apply for this, and then we have an MCQ exam, and we select the top 16 people, and they get this the free reading books from China. So, for more details, visit our website, and it's also one more platform which might inspire. Uh, some of you to take the line of the class. With that, uh, I take this opportunity to thank the organizers for making me work on something which I've never done.
have a wonderful life ahead. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you sometime, somewhere. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Dr. Kopi. It was such a pleasure listening. I wish uh, that I would be exposed to su such a lecture way back in 1980. Maybe things would have worked out differently for me. <laughs> <laughs> you did wonderfully well. You are an inspiration to so many. So I don't think you needed any lectures then. <laughs> yeah, we just went with the flow. And never used our, our brains as such to analyze what we are doing or uh, why we should be doing such things. But anyway, it worked. Um, so I got some, a few questions for you, Dr. Kopi. Uh, I hope you are okay with answering. Uh, of course. Uh, the first question it is uh, somebody is asking if it is good to invest on a microscope or uh, it is just sufficient to have loops in for a good endo practice. Uh, the, the true answer is yes. The, the journey of, uh, of magnification of trying to do better would start with a loop because it's more economical. But throughout life, you will have these two uh, options always. The easier option and the more economical option, which most of the people would take. And the more difficult option, and probably sometimes the more expensive option, is to probably go for a microscope. But uh, in, in, if I look back at the defining point financially in my career, if you ask me financially aspect of what happens in your career, I think financially I became more independent as a practitioner uh, after my journey of microscope became than when I was just another endodontist without a microscope. So for those who are talking about success in life as a clinician, then I think you need to have uh, this. I have learned from some of the best uh, medical doctors I have treat, treated. Uh, I get a lot of medicos, and when they treat them, I ask them some questions like this. What are your thoughts and what should be the ideal way of a clinical practice should be? And all the top line doctors I have met have always told me one thing to is invest on skills and invest on the right machines. They taught me, told me these two points consistently across invest on your skills and invest on the right equipment. Uh, so I personally feel I always fail. I invest more on my skill set and on my, my clinic and my center because that is your temple. That is your church. That is the area where the God lives there. That's where everything is uh, residing. And you have to give the best output can only happen when you have the best input. So I have no doubts in my mind, even if it's difficult, you should try to uh, slowly but surely invest in the right equipment, which in my uh, opinion in endo is the basic minimum would be a microscope. Yes. Um, so Dr. Gopi, another question is that uh, what, what is the status of fellowship courses versus uh, masters? Okay, in a, in a uh, good uh, clinical practice. Uh, as I told the earlier, I don't think our degrees, uh, whether we do, the, I've seen a lot of MDS professionals doing good, but I also see a lot of BDS professionals doing very good. In Chennai, I don't want to name, but in South Chennai, the best clinician I know, the top ranking clinician I know in Chennai, South of Chennai, is a BDS uh, a senior of mine. And he is, uh, has the best clinical practice, most successful clinical practice, but he has the best skill sets also. So, the question is not about whether you should do a fellowship or an MDS. It's not going to guarantee anything. But what you should ask yourself is, if you are passionate about something, you either do a specialty in that, or even if you're not able to do a specialty in that, I know many people who do a fellowship or a training program, and that becomes a, not the end, but the sounding board from which they start doing better and better things. So for a BDS student who is unable to do MDS for some strange reason, it could be financial, it could be their 
some family issues or for which they are not able to do pursue a master's degree because a master's degree any day is better because it gives you three years of focused training on something. The amount of time which it gives you is best. But for some reason, you are not able to do that. Then yes, plan B should be to try to follow your path in, in an avenue like a fellowship or a, a dedicated programs in which you try to invest it. So to me, the journey is more important and not the, the degree which you are going to get out of it. Okay, the third question is uh, what to do with patients uh, who do window shopping or maybe they uh, indulge in bargaining. And uh, so how do you treat them? Uh, if you, uh, if you, as a clinician, you will always uh, get these kind of patients. And I have picked up this uh, uh, as a consultant in my early part of my career since I used to go to many clinics. I, I used to ask this question to all the seniors with whom I work. And the best answer I got was uh, during my work with Dr. Acharya. And uh, what she told is there will always be a class of uh, patients who will be shoppers. And the window shoppers and bargainers would be there. But they will only go to a shop where you know there is bargaining allowed. So you and me, if we are coming to Chennai and you go to the streets of Tinagar, you have a lot of shops where you can pick up a lot of trinkets. Including you and me, we will go and bargain there. Because you know that is the norm. Aapko bargain karna padega. Because that is the norm there. So when you do a run a medical center, if you start allowing bargaining at the start of your career, throughout your life, you will be behaving like a bargainer. Each patient will ask a discount and you will go through that. But if you go to a car showroom and you're going to buy, you don't get discounts and bargains when you're in a good place. You know that the price is fixed. So, so that's how you have to ask yourself whether you are an Apple showroom for the product or are you a roadside seller which will bargain for everything. So in my practice, personally speaking, prices are fixed. There will be bargainers who will go away from you, but it's a, these are patients you don't want to treat because bargain uh, patients are always looking at cost and not quality. And, and to me, a good clinician who's able to give quality, so there, these two cannot set. So in India, the concept of cheap and best, only in India it exists. I want cheap and I want it best. It, these are two, two, two opposite things. How can you have something cheap and you can have it best? It doesn't exist anywhere on earth in any concept. So my tip to any clinician is when you start your practice, get your, your be confident of your skill sets, draw a line of your costing, which is firm. It need not be the most expensive, but when you draw a line in your costing, that is not negotiable. You can have a fixed discount for your friends, for your relatives, for teachers, for medical doctors. So I have these kind of uh, criteria. I have a fixed percentage discount for my te for teachers, for friends, relatives, and medical doctors. But remaining times, I say you you should be non-negotiable. It's my only tip for any successful practice. I also agree with that. <laughs> so, uh, what is the future of microendotronics in India? As I told you, I, I think, uh, frankly speaking, the quality of endo is not great in India. So, the future of retreatment is greater. Right now, in my center, today is a Saturday, it's going to be a busy day after this. For me, uh, my 60% of my work is retreatment. 60%, more than 50% is now becoming retreatments. So uh, the future is fantastic and retreatments cannot happen without microscopes and advanced things. So I think dentistry per se or anywhere on earth, including in India, is good for the select 10 to 25 percent, top percent, if you have watched my slide, the cream of dental providers who can co provide quality, the future is fantastic. So for any student who is watching this, you want to be a successful clinician Get your skill sets right, practice, and you will attract patients instead of you running behind patients as a consultant from one clinic to the other. It's the, the only message I have learned in my life. So I've got one question for you, which uh, I personally wouldn't like to ask, but uh, anyway, since it has been sent here, what are the must-have equipments during initial start of practice? Uh, I will put it this way. I started my practice with a 2 lakh rupee State Bank of India doctor plus loan. 
and I invested 20,000 rupees from my hand. So that was the budget to start a practice. So when you start a practice, you cannot have everything what you want. But I would strongly say that when you have any clinical practice, the basic things should be of good quality. I think a compressor in your clinic has to be good. It should work. A scaler should be good. A basic X-ray machine should be good. So for me, the more than the chair and the ambience, the basic infrastructure of your clinic should be sound and dependable. So these are the things which you need, after which you bring, then you grow. So then you buy your endomotor, then an FX locator, but slowly. For me, my Christmas gifts to myself, every year I believe in Christmas gifting myself and my practice is in buying something which is good every year for my practice. So there is something new in your practice every year. So you can't buy everything on the year one, but every year I look forward for the next year that's when I invest on something which is of an equipment which is better. So I didn't buy a RVG immediately. I bought the endomotor the first year, the apex locator the next year, then the RVG came in, then the microscope came in, then everything moves stepwise. So you can't buy everything on day one. So it's again a journey. So whatever you buy, buy the good equipments and start off slow, surely, and then grow, just like a tree. Yeah, so actually a uh, priority list uh, is very much essential for this to start here. Actually, the I have realized that the uh, the beginners, they start investing on a aquarium yeah. and TACs and, and on their budget is gone on that. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. they make it so much. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. So ambience, I feel, is should be there. It should be a clean place. It's not the most pretty looking place. It should be a clean place. It's so important for your practice because hygiene is so important to attract the right patients. But otherwise, you, you, I think you should invest more on the basic equipments of good quality in the long run. Yeah, and may I add one more point here? I think yeah. uh, we have to stress this and I, I feel most of the clinics, uh, you know, uh, look at it as secondary, but I feel Autoclave, a good autoclave is one which we all have to invest in the first go, yeah. right? Because we are uh, responsible for the patient's well-being and, uh, you know, infection control should be the, uh, that is for uh, all specialties, I would say, not only being an endodontist or uh, for all specialties, I would say. Totally agree. Yeah, and now nowadays the segregation of uh, biomedical waste is also a very, very important uh, aspect of your clinic you just can't throw the trash in one corner and allow it to rot there so the rules are very strict about that anyway dr gopi thank you so much i know that it will be a bill line of patients waiting for you at the yeah. practice <laughs> but uh, thanks a lot uh, before i end i would like to thank Mal dr malakshmi for giving me this opportunity thank you so much and uh, uh, continuation of a good uh, yeah pulp <laughs> Thank you very much. Just two minutes of your time. I'll not take much. Uh, thank you, Gopi. I really love that uh, um, phrase when you said, no, I loved all your slides, by the way. And the best was that perseverance beats talent. If talent does not persevere. That was a fantastic uh, quote, I would say. Yes, talent does help, but uh, perseverance helps better. So thank you so much, Gopi, for, for your wonderful uh, lecture. And uh, to Dr. Aida also for her uh, beautiful moderation and uh, in spite of your busy schedule I know Gopi has to go back to his patients Aida has to go back to her uh, uh, work so uh, thank you both very much thank you so much